Let's talk about the Dumbo remake. You fucked around and found out. Now we're going to be talking about the 2019 Dumbo remake. So I know what you're about to hear might shock you, but I have to be honest. I don't think Dumbo 2019 is a very good movie. In fact, I think it's one of the worst trash Disney remakes. I don't like it. There are a lot of things wrong with Dumbo 2019. It looks pretty bad. Tim Burton drags some absolutely heinous performances out of his actors. I want to make scientific discoveries. I want to be noticed for my mind. It's boring AF, like I have a hard time paying attention to it. And you know, it's not about Dumbo anymore. The original Dumbo is all Dumbo all the time. Now we're lucky if we even get to see the little man. He's kind of reduced to an object that we look at and find cute, and I miss him being a character who we enjoy the movie with. I don't know, make it a cute elephant with big ears movie, not a bootleg series of unfortunate events. Make it Dumbo, not Crumbo. That's my take. With that general review out of the way, I want to zoom in on what I think is the most horrendous and telling scene in this movie. It's interpretation of pink elephants. So for those who haven't seen the original Dumbo, the pink elephant section is a lengthy, surreal animation sequence that the movie just kind of throws in there. Dumbo randomly gets drunk, hallucinates this strange fever dream, and we basically move on. And it's great. It's funny and beautiful and iconic. In the remake, though, this is how they do the scene. Dumbo walks into the circus and sees some guys blowing pink elephant bubbles. The bubbles are incredibly transparent and so they don't really contrast with the background. The scene keeps cutting back to Dumbo's reaction, this CGI elephant bobbing up and down weirdly. Music plays, but there are no lyrics. It's like a whimsical orchestral version of the original song, and far worse. We watch this for around two minutes. So looking at this, I guess my question is, why? Why make this scene so banal, so quote-unquote realistic? Even within the more cartoony 1940 Dumbo, Pink Elephants was supposed to be weird and unjustified and surreal, a break from the reality of the film. And it could have been fun to update that, remake Dumbo, do a really crazy CGI Pink Elephants. So why not? Why is it like this? Why does the film feel it must waste my time in this way? Well, I think the answer speaks to the fundamental problem with so many of these Disney remakes, one you'll see over and over in this video. They are fundamentally terrified of making interesting artistic choices. These movies can't be pretty or clever or weird, and as a result, we are left here, left with this. Dumbo 2019 doesn't remake Pink Elephants, it has no interest in that. No, all it can do is reference the material, nod its head, say that it remembers what Pink Elephants is, and that we should know that it remembers. The scene is so hollow and sad that it actually kind of puts me in a bad mood. Like, why remake Dumbo if you hate it this much? It's a great movie. Anyway, Dumbo 2019 does happen to have one of the best characters to ever grace a Disney remake. This mean carny guy who bullies Dumbo. <laughs> I call him the Rat King. I love him. He dies 20 minutes into the movie. He's really good. There's a lot that's just obviously wrong with the Beauty and the Beast 2017 live-action remake. The Beast sings this new, extraordinarily emotional ballad about how sad he is, and it absolutely does not work. I never needed anybody in my life. We get to see all the living furniture slowly turn into inanimate objects as Mrs. Potts screams for her dying son. Where is my little boy? In one of the last scenes, the beast is about to jump, and Belle shouts at him, No, don't! It's too far! Don't! It's too far! And then he jumps, and it's 100% fine. <laughs> By the way, I checked the original movie, and nothing remotely like this line happens. A writer for this remake had to look at the script and be like, Wow, the beast sure is jumping pretty far in this scene. It would just make sense for Belle to shout, Don't do it! Don't jump! It's a very odd decision, I don't understand it. But I can kinda forgive all that stuff, I can even like it. Is it good that we have to watch Lumiere's candle, his very soul, go out right before our very eyes? 
No, it's not good. But I'm not really here for a good time. I'm here for a fun time. And I don't know, all that stuff is kind of fun and weird and campy. But here's the thing, while all these little oddities seem fun on the face of it, none of it works because the movie itself isn't fun at all. In fact, it is painfully boring. The original Beauty and the Beast is an hour and 20 minutes long. The new one is two hours, 40 full minutes longer. By the hour mark in the original film, Belle and the Beast were already in love. Gaston was about to attack. We were very close to the climax. By the hour mark in the remake, all the furniture is singing about how sad they are. All those days in the sun were a gift to relive just one. Nothing has really happened. And for all that extra time, none of it really adds anything. It's just a bunch of random scenes I can't imagine caring about. Some weird teleportation plot with Belle's mother's backstory. A genuinely unhinged scene about how all the servants, including this literal child, are responsible for the beast's curse because they didn't help him as a kid. It's not for you to worry about, Lamb. We've made our bed, and we must lie in it. An extended sequence about Gaston attempting to murder Belle's father while LeFou watches in awe. All this stuff is awful, it doesn't mean anything, and it makes the film a chore to get through. But it also screws up the story on an even deeper level. The original Beauty and the Beast is an extremely simple film largely about the relationship between Belle and the Beast and the redemptive power of love. It's a charming gothic romance, and I think it works really well. In the remake, though, the romance, the characters, the plot, none of it feels like a priority. For all the scenes that are added, none center around the relationship between our two main characters, and that's because the movie is passionate about one thing and one thing alone, showing us a sordid, dull scenes in the Beauty and the Beast universe. Where did you take us? Paris. It's bad. It's a bad idea for a movie, and they did a bad job with it. Uh, moving on. So I actually made a video about the Aladdin remake around a year ago, and so I thought writing this review would be kind of easy. Um, but then, when it came time to actually watch the movie again, uh, I I couldn't do it. I could not, uh, couldn't do it. Uh, I, I got to the first song. I got to the first song in the Aladdin remake, or I guess the second song. I got to him to Aladdin singing. There's so much. Um, and I said to myself, uh, no, I'm not gonna do this. Um, I'm not gonna, I, I, I can't do it today. I can't, I won't be doing it uh, any other day either. Um, so there will be no Aladdin uh, review um, in this video. I won't be talking about it. Okay, let's talk about Cruella from 2021. Now, to be fair, Cruella isn't a Disney remake. It's like a vague prequel to 101 Dalmatians, but let's review it anyway. So, it's been a long time since I watched a movie that made me quite as annoyed as Cruella did. It's absolutely the epitome of filth cinema, and I don't like it uh, because it's vile. I remember when it came out, there was like Twitter discourse about if Cruella was fucked up because it was girl bossifying an animal abuser. And oh, how I wish that was my critique of the film. How I wish that it painted Cruella as an absolute queen that slays animals because at least that would be a fun thing thing to make a movie about. They really would make fabulous Kate. The dogs? <laughs> I'm joking. No, you can tell none of the people who made this point actually watched this movie because Cruella is way, way too boring to do such a thing. The story basically surrounds a young Cruella trying to avenge her mother's death by taking down her murderer, some fashionista baroness lady. And herein lies the problem. Put simply, the protagonist's motivations are fairly reasonable. Cruella is not all that evil, and this never changes over the course of the film. Sure, Cruella gets kind of mean when plotting against these murderers. She doesn't treat her friends properly. She's generally kind of rude. No, 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 you can't talk to us like that. We're helping you here. So don't. But there's never a moment where she, like, does a bad thing to a person. 
And besides that, by the end of the movie, she pretty much resolves her meanness, makes amends with her little found family, and generally seems nice. There is absolutely nothing in this film to suggest that this lady is gonna become cruel, gonna become the kind of person who might skin a dog. In essence, the movie is not an origin story for the Cruella de Vil of 101 Dalmatians. No, it's about Crimella de Spill, a little loser who nobody gives a fuck about. And you know, on some level, I want to say that that's okay. Do I think it makes sense to tell a story about Cruella de Vil where she doesn't become a bad guy? No, I don't see the point. It seems like the opposite of fun, and it leaves me wondering why the story even chose the subject it chose. Still though, it's kind of a creative choice, I guess, and if the movie had embraced that and done it well, well, there you go, it would have been a fine movie. Instead, though, the film just feels really confused. Like, it keeps pretending it's gonna be this whole villain backstory. Toward the conclusion, Cruella says, I'm not Estella, that's her given name, I'm Cruella, because I'm a little bit raunchy. Goodbye, Estella. She was with her mother now. I'll take it from here. But Cruella was alive. And then, at the very end, we see Cruella giving away the Dalmatians, who she's presumably gonna murder one day. But none of it makes any sense. She's not Cruella, she's just a normal lady. And she's not gonna kill any dogs, she's just a normal lady. Who are you trying to fool, movie? I know a normal lady when I see one. In the end, the whole movie just feels so cowardly, like it wants to have a mean story but can't bear the thought of its protagonist being mean. I don't get it. The most iconic scene in the film is at the very start, when Cruella, as a child, sees her mother murdered by Dalmatians. When people saw this scene out of context, they thought it was stupid, which, you know it is, but it also objectively rocks. The idea that Cruella wants to kill all Dalmatians because they murdered her mother is extremely funny and also kind of works as her motivation. It's unhinged and campy and ridiculous in all the best ways, and I wish the movie had leaned into it. But of course it doesn't, uh, because Cruella hates fun and is a bad movie. Woo! I liked the Lady and the Tramp remake fine. I actually saw it before I saw the original for whatever reason, thought it was okay, and then when I did see the original, I thought that was okay too. That's the thing about Lady and the Tramp. It's fine. There's not much to it, and not much the remake could screw up. I liked this line from the ant. She's normally really good. I think you're thinking of cats. I liked ladies' little tail wags. They were very cool. I don't know. It, it was fine. Here's two nitpicks before we move on. I don't like this line Lady says to the tramp right at the end. Did you steal that one too? Did you steal that bone? What are you even talking about right now, Lady? He, he he's, he's a dog. He's like, he's fully a dog. What do you care if he stole the bone? Why don't you stop judging all the time? Neither of you freaks have worked a day in your lives, so maybe you should let him enjoy a little bit. Maybe you should let him enjoy the bone. Maybe you don't gotta, you know, be a little whisper in his ear telling him he stole that bone. Maybe he doesn't need to hear that right now. You know, what What did you do to- I also don't like how they changed the song, He's a Tramp. He's a tramp, but they love him. Breaks a new heart every day. In the original, the song is unapologetically about how the tramp is a huge slut and how everyone loves him for it and wants to have sex with him. It has nothing to do with the rest of the movie, his sexual promiscuity never comes up before or after this scene, but it rocks and is by far the best moments in the movie. Honestly, it still is the best moment of the remake. I mean, it's a great song, but they changed it, so now it's about how the tramp is like a loner. He's a loner! And, um, not a slut anymore. And I don't like that as much. So, uh, that's it. Next movie. Come in! Put the tripod down. Put, the, put it down. I want to talk to you about everything wrong with the 2022 Pinocchio remake. Your dreams come true. 
Ew, Jiminy Cricket is gross to me. Leave me alone. You sound weird, freak. You sound nasty. Just how it really was when he was. Oh, Tom Hanks sings a little bit in this movie. I don't think I've ever heard Tom Hanks sing, and I want to find that endearing, uh, but I don't. Oh, his fucking son's dead? Like his Pinocchio lookalike ass son died, and that's why he wants a new son? Jesus Christ. Why is the cat so ugly? Look at the original movie's cat. What was this movie's budget? You're a boy made out of pine. Pinocchio. Cool exposition on Pinocchio's name, dweeb. Who gives a fuck? Why does the fish look like that? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you not afford wood anymore? Did you not have the budget for wood? Like, I can't imagine a better time for a practical effect than a literal doll that could exist. The CGI looks bad. So they took the cuckoo clock scene and replaced the clocks with Disney references. How awful. How unbelievably lame. At least have a Shrek in there. At least have an E.T. clock. Don't just make it other movies you remade. Look at, look at Pinocchio there in the moonlight. He looks almost like a real boy. Yeah, sure. It looks like a real boy, Geppetto. Just like a human. Absolutely. Maybe you should stop gaslighting your cat, you dark triad freak. If my wish came true, Figaro, that would be one. Tom Hanks has been murmuring to himself now for the last four hours. It's weirdly unsettling. The soul of Geppetto's son enters Pinocchio's body. I cannot believe they decided to do this. Also, if that's really his dead son all up in there, why does he lack a conscience? Was your son a freak just like you, old man? Sounds like your head is made of white pine. Hence... Pinocchio. Why are you explaining once again the Pinocchio pun? Who cares? Who fucking cares at all? And that is the entire problem with the world today. Are you my conscience? Huh? Me? Uh, I'm not a conscience. I'm a cricket. More of an insect than an instinct. Would you like to be his conscience? Me? No thanks. I've, uh... Got enough on my plate. How is it like this? Why are your characters speaking in this way? I have literally never seen worse performances in my life. This is genuinely a room tier scene. Oh, well, buongiorno, Sophia. Why are we following daddy? Why do we gotta spend more time with daddy? I'm so afraid this is gonna be the whole movie, please. I'm Pine, that's why I'm called- Oh, yes, Pine. They once again choose to explain the Pine thing. The, the, genuinely, this one gets to me. I feel like I'm going crazy. We need a simple, strong stage name. Slab Oakley. Chad Log? <gasps> I've got it. Chris Pine! Ooh, epic Chris Pine joke. Fucking awesome, bro. Get out and stay out! School is for real children, not the ridiculous of pop sim. Okay, this is an important change. In the original film, Pinocchio is simply seduced by the possibility of fame and skips school. Now, he wants to go to school, is forced out, and then goes with the fox. Why? Like, what's the point? Pinocchio is a story about a kid who sometimes does bad things. Why do we feel the need to scrub his character's wrong choices, make it all about puppet racism or whatever? Silly. Bad. So it's true. Stromboli got his grubby hands on a magic puppet. So the remake introduces this character, Fabiana, for some reason. I don't get it. I don't understand her or why I'm watching her. And I'm Fabiana and I'm never going to be famous. She says nobody gives a fuck about her, uh, and I do agree. Half human, half marionette, I'm practicing my pirouette. So in a story where a marionette is used as a metaphor for the human soul emerging without complete moral agency, some lady with a bad leg describes herself as half marionette. Why do this? Who wrote this movie? Did they give it thought? Did they give their words thought? <laughs> Locked solid. Locked solid. Oh, you mean you can't pick the lock, you pompous fuck. Wow, it's such a solid lock. I'd be 100% able to pick it if this lock wasn't so solid. Prick. But I didn't want to be famous. I wanted to go to school. Hey! 
He was literally thrown out of school in this version, so why are you acting like he was totally morally responsible? Now quit telling those whoppers! Now quit telling those whoppers! I'm Ladwick! What's your name, Slats? Thank God for this authentic, real New Jersey boy. I like him, and I like the little faces he makes. Real boys always want more. Always want more. And real girls always like the real boys more. Okay, so first of all, they add this peer pressure ass dare song and it's bad. But also, what even is that lyric? Like you added girls to the Pleasure Island plot, which, you know, that's fine. But now their every experience centers around what kind of boys they want? It blows. Give them a personality. Look, free Ruby! They drink root beer, whereas in the original film, the kids just drink beer, and I actually find that really interesting. Like, the point of Pinocchio 1940 is that beer turns kids into asses when they drink it. I get that's not the most modern of messages, but I don't understand why you'd include the beer at all if you wanted to remove the entire reason for it being there. For me, this really gets at how the main gesture of Disney remakes isn't to, like, make a fun story, but to sanitize the original films. The kids drinking beer in Pinocchio is not offensive to anyone. It's literally a PSA, right? Who cares? But it does feel like something. A bit strange, a bit anachronistic, a bit grown up. And so, we cut it out, don't think about it, and ignore the fact that the scene suddenly makes way less sense. Hey Slack, we gotta come back here and bust up some clocks. <laughs> they look like my father's clocks. Pinocchio realizes that Treasure Island is bad when he sees all the boys destroying clocks, because I guess it's like a microaggression against his clock-making father. It's so on the nose that I honestly kind of respect it. He needed to get to Pleasure Island to look for Pinocchio, so he sold all his clocks and he bought a boat. Those clocks meant everything to him. It's his life's work. Wow, Geppetto sold his treasured clocks to search for Pinocchio, got himself a $40 boat for his life's work. Guess he kind of sucked ass at clocks, huh? Nobody cared, I guess. Pinocchio? Running on the water? This is a miracle! Weirdly explicit Christ reference here. Geppetto observes that Pinocchio is running on water and describes it as a miracle. I don't really get it, honestly. I mean, Jiminy Cricket is Jesus Christ, right? Instructing our broken, sinful souls toward higher consciousness. I'm not saying I don't like Pinocchio as Christ, but I am saying I don't understand it. Everything comes in, but nothing goes out, except the other way. Okay, now's as good a time as any to talk about Tom Hanks in this movie, and honestly, I'd say it's the worst performance of his entire career. At times, when Hanks acts like he does here or in a few other scenes, it feels like he's reminding you that he's Tom Hanks, and Tom Hanks does those affectations. Father. Wake up! Okay, for some reason they have Geppetto almost die in the remake, and then have Pinocchio sing When You Wish Upon a Star and cry to bring him back to life. When you wish upon a star. This has got to be one of the most horrible ways I can imagine ending this movie. It feels so purposeless and odd, like they just needed their Disney branding exercise in there. They didn't even have the bravery to have a shooting star be in the scene. It's complete gibberish, uh, much like the entire movie. That was all the things I had in mind for saying the Pinocchio 2022 remake uh, is bad. Okay, let's talk about Maleficent from 2014. You know, it's hard not to compare this film with the one that would spiritually succeed it seven years later, Cruella. They are both Disney villain backstory movies, after all. And in this comparison, I'd say Maleficent comes out on top simply because it has dignity. Like, Maleficent does try to make its evil protagonist sympathetic, but unlike Cruella, Maleficent explicitly and unapologetically breaks with its source material to accomplish that task. 
The witch now tries to undo the curse she places on Aurora, and it's her kiss that ultimately wakes the princess up, not the prince's. In this regard, it's kind of a brave movie. It has a spine. It embraces its own weird fanfiction vibes, and I like that. That said, on a moment-to-moment -moment level, I just don't like Maleficent. It's not my thing, and I think it's pretty bad. For one, and this is my own taste speaking here, I just don't like the idea behind the movie. Maleficent in the original Sleeping Beauty is evil, sure, but not in the way a person is evil. Rather, she is the archetypal embodiment of chaos and destruction, the spirit of cold and winter and entropy. Until Maleficent sends a frost. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh dear. She always ruins your nicest flowers. In the end, Maleficent really isn't the problem in Aurora's life. Rather, it's the overprotective parents who love their daughter so much that they refuse to acknowledge the existence of evil and danger. They deny the presence of shadow in their lives, refuse to invite Maleficent to the party, and are punished as a result. To this end, I'm not sold on Maleficent's redemption and kind of feel like that choice tramples on the message and meaning of the original film. Maybe that's an overly precious critique, but you know, there it is. My bigger problem with Maleficent, though, is that it's just a bit of a, a bad movie. It has weird, kind of off energy, I think. Like, the movie makes this whole production out of characterizing Aurora, the Sleeping Beauty, which, fine, that's an okay idea, but man, her vibes are all wrong. For example, look at this scene where she first meets her prince. Can you help me? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was my fault. I rushed into... Forgive me. Something's wrong with it, right? When I first watched the movie, I rewound it like three times because it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, have these actors met before? Are they supposed to like each other? Do they learn their lines? It's so wooden and ridiculous that I almost find it spooky. What's your name? It's Philip. And honestly, that's the whole movie for me. Just a bit awkward and surreal in a bad way. Maleficent is a rare case among these films because I do understand why someone might like it a lot. Uh, but that person is not me. Okay, let's move on and talk about the 2020 Mulan remake, and boy, what a bad but also interesting movie this one is. We're going to be spending a weird amount of time talking about Mulan. So if you haven't seen it, Mulan is about a woman who takes her father's place in war against Mongolia even though men are the only ones allowed and expected to serve. And as we step into this remake, the main thing it seems to want to be about is feminism, making explicit and reinforcing the feminist message of the original film. Just talk to her like you're talking to me now. For one thing, we have a new lady character on the Mongolian side, a witch. And her purpose, roughly, is to show us that the patriarchy is ubiquitous. The witch has found a place where she is supposedly accepted as a woman, where she doesn't need to hide her power, but even then, she is subjugated, seen as a possession, a slave. Now I know I serve you. I am the slave. And you would do well to remember it. Mulan's conflict, then, is not positioned as individual, but systemic. Solving it will require a fundamental shift in how women are treated. Perhaps more important to this point, the Mulan remake has a new ending. In the original film, after Mulan saves the day, the Emperor asks her if she wants to be a higher up in his military, and she says, With all due respect, Your Excellency, I think I've been away from home long enough. Which, you know, that's fine, but it is kind of odd, right? After a whole movie of fighting against her role, living under the weight of gendered expectations, our protagonist just embraces traditional feminine living. 
Now, to be clear, this is how the original ballad of Mulan goes, and so I understand keeping the story that way. But still, it does kind of feel messy and asymmetrical to a modern audience. And so, you know, the movie changes it. Now Mulan becomes a general or whatever. Epic. So, neither of these changes actually bother me at all. I think it's fine to want to paint a more transparent, clean, feminist message onto the film, and it makes sense to do that in a remake. But what I find so interesting about this movie is that even though it seems so devoted to its theming, in the end, it completely falls on its face when it comes time to actually convey that theme, show it to us in a way that means something and carries weight. Let's start here with the obvious problem, the music, or rather the lack thereof. Mulan 2020 wanted to be more mature, wanted to be a gritty war movie for some reason, and so the creators did away with all the musical numbers. This is, of course, a bad idea on its face. The music in the original absolutely slapped, it's the best part of the whole thing, and there is no good reason to take it out. But the problem goes deeper than that, I think. See, the songs in the 1998 film actually accomplish stuff. They add a lot of meaningful material to the story. Reflections is raw and impactful. The fact that it essentially starts the story and introduces our protagonist tells us that we are going to be straining against social expectation in this movie, feeling ill at ease with our bodies, experiencing Mulan's powerlessness, her lack of authority over her own image in society. Mr. Maybe even better, the song I'll Make a Man Out of You speaks delightfully to the film's central conflict and theme. Men, within the logic of the song, are not born, they are made, produced through the application of discipline and social force. And if these other people can be made into men, pushed into the performance of maleness, then why can't Mulan? The 2020 remake cuts this stuff out, makes everything intense and adult, but it doesn't replace that clarity of emotion with anything. It's just this striking absence at the heart of the film. What's more, it doesn't help that feeling that the story is bloated in some really unfortunate ways. And here, let's focus on the end of the movie. 40 minutes from the ending, after revealing that she's a woman, Mulan tries to get her general to trust her plan for dealing with the Mongolian army. And he does. He believes her, and they carry out her plan. Your actions have brought disgrace and dishonor to this regiment, to this kingdom, and to your own family. Your loyalty and bravery are without question. That's striking to me, because essentially it means that the entire narrative resolves long before the movie's climax. That we have 40 minutes to not care or think about what the film is doing, what it's trying to say about women or patriarchy. That's an odd problem too, because the original doesn't have it at all. Up to the very last moment, Mulan's identity as a woman is an important problem, one whose resolution requires the emperor himself. Her gender is always a source of conflict, and one that we are forced to engage with over and over. Finally, we have the problem of characterization, and what I mean there is that the characters are boring and lifeless. I can think of one real scene where Mulan expresses her personality, but besides that, she's really just quiet and we don't see a lot of human moments from her. If the protagonist of your movie doesn't express emotions, doesn't convey problems her world has in a way that makes them feel important and motivated, then I probably won't care about those problems, simple as that. Even Mulan's foil, the witch, has a similar issue. I want to be invested in her conflict and in what her conflict says about Mulan, but it doesn't add up to much. Let's look at her last scenes in the movie. Mulan begs her to reconsider her alignment with Mongolia, and she says, They accept you, but they will never accept me. 
This is a line we never get any explanation for. Like, why won't they accept her if they accepted Mulan? What's the main problem here? I have no idea. And then, in the very next scene we see her, she just kills herself to save Mulan's life. So, you know, what convinced her? Why is she now on Team Mulan, and why, from a storytelling perspective, did she have to kill herself to rescue her new friend? None of it feels right, or personal, or justified, and so none of it has emotional or thematic weight. My point here is that Mulan 2020 may have a cleaner point than the original film does. It makes choices that expresses its desired themes in a very obvious, efficient way. A girl. A woman. But what it leaves behind is a sterile, meaningless aftertaste. A movie that plays the part, but that is fundamentally uninterested in what it actually wants to say and how it actually wants us to feel. It's bad, I think. I don't like it. Let's move on and talk about the 2015 Cinderella remake. So I liked this movie. I thought it was pretty good, and good in a way that reminded me what remakes could do and why they should sometimes exist. Cinderella 2015 starts earlier than the original does. We watch as our protagonist grows up, loses her mother, sees her father marry the evil stepmother, etc. At first, I thought this was kind of silly. So many of these Disney remakes rely exclusively on exposition. Treat the simple act of explaining things to the audience as though that makes for interesting art. I don't care about Belle's mother. I don't care that Scar wanted to date Mufasa's wife. Long ago, you chose Mufasa over me. But now there is a new king. This information is communicated to me only because these movies have nothing better to say. But in the case of Cinderella, this exposition actually works. That Cinderella had a family, that she had a father, and that he married this awful woman is an interesting thing to me, and I think they do a decent job of it. I remember one scene where Cinderella and her dad are talking about him missing his late wife, and the stepmother overhears them. You miss her. Do you? Very much. I like this scene a lot because it's not heavy-handed or on the nose. That the stepmother feels insecure about her husband's grief does not explain why she abuses Cinderella to the extent that she does. It doesn't overshadow her cruelty or give her a plausible, tragic excuse. No, it's more humble than that. It just says that this is a person, that she has a relationship to people, that she can be sad sometimes in a way that is real and vivid. And while I do love the original stepmother, I thought this interpretation was fresh, uh, and cool. Besides all that, I don't know, I think it's cute. The cast is fun to watch, I like Prince Charming and actually think he has chemistry with Cinderella, which is extremely rare in these movies. And I also like that Cinderella is a film that's fundamentally about people, as in most of the things that happen in it are pretty mundane and the animal characters are just not that important. Just the simple fact that the story doesn't require much horrible CGI puts it head and shoulders above almost every other movie in this genre. Is that a fair point to make? I don't know, but it did make the movie bearable to look at. With that said though, I have some nitpicks. I really didn't enjoy Cinderella's last scene with her stepmom where she says this. I forgive you. You know, I'm not totally against the idea of showing your protagonist forgiving her awful abuser so she can move on with her life. That might be interesting. But when I see this scene, the only thing I can think is, no you don't. Nothing would suggest that you forgave her, nothing changed in your character that would allow for this forgiveness. It feels like a moment trying to make Cinderella as Christ-like as humanly possible, but it doesn't have any reality to it. Oh, also, the movie has a catchphrase, bravery and kindness. Have courage and be kind. It's the advice Cinderella's mom gave before she died, and the movie repeats it just incessantly, like a really weird amount. In the last five minutes, they say these words three separate times, and I do not get it. Have courage and be kind. Be kind. <laughs> and have courage. Courage? and kindness. It's not an interesting or catchy thing to say, right? It's mostly just two positive traits a person can have. And yet the writers are just like, nah man, we gotta bang this shit into their heads. Bravery and kindness, man, they need to, they need to hear that. 
Who cares? Anyway, that's all the thoughts I had about Cinderella. Mwah. What is there to say about Alice in Wonderland 2010 that hasn't already been said? Although it's not a proper remake, taking place long after the original film and book, it's a movie that essentially started this era of Disney remakes and it suffers from many of the problems that typify the genre. Put simply, Alice in Wonderland is a fun, goofy story. It's all over the place and whimsical and interesting, and the remake took that and made it as ordinary and tedious as is humanly possible. Now, the whole thing is dominated by this very conventional plot where Alice has to, like, save the kingdom, as has been prophesized by the dumb prophecy. It's very Narnia in a bad way. That said, I have watched so many remakes for this video, remake after remake after remake, and I have to admit something. Alice in Wonderland 2010 is a high-tier Disney remake. It's okay compared to the other ones. It has some pretty funny jokes, it looks alright, you can feel watching it that Tim Burton still has a soul, that he hasn't gone full Dumbo yet. I like this dog. I like when Alice drinks Anne Hathaway's spit water. <laughs> I like the dance. I think it's good when they include a dance in a movie. Alice in Wonderland is quite bad, uh, but it's also fine, and I have to respect it for that, I guess. Let's talk about the 2016 Jungle Book. So, The Jungle Book 2016 is pretty obviously the best Disney remake. It came out at a time when the whole remake thing was kind of coming into itself, and honestly, it gave me false hope that these movies could be passable. So, let's just zoom in on two things I particularly like about this movie. First, it's not structurally rigid. Like the original, the plot largely plays second fiddle to the set pieces of the movie, and I think that's a really fun, organic way of telling the story. It's episodic, and more of these films deserve to be episodic. Three-act storytelling is not an appropriate choice for Alice and Wonderland or Dumbo, and it's good that they embrace that fact for The Jungle Book. Second, among all the Disney remakes, this movie has the one and only scene I'd say is actually an improvement over the original film. And that is, of course, the King Louis the Orangutan scene where he sings, I wanna be like you. Oh, what we do? I wanna be like you. Don't get me wrong, I like the original version of this scene and think it's probably musically stronger, uh, but this shit simply rules. Christopher Walken plays Louis. He gives a surprisingly good vocal performance. It's visually striking and genuinely kind of unsettling in an unexpected way. Point is, Disney actually had the bravery here to give us a big-lipped alligator moment, and I genuinely appreciate it. So that's it for Jungle Book 2016. Let's move the F on. So, I already made a whole video about the Lion King remake a few years ago. I watched the film around three times when I made it, and much like Aladdin, I just can't bring myself to watch it again. Nevertheless, it is to me the most interesting Disney remake ever made, and it's frankly not even close. Most movies that are bad are bad for a lot of reasons. Because some scene doesn't work, or some character is stale, or because it's paced poorly. Some of those critiques probably apply to the Lion King 20. 19. In fact, they all kind of do, but I think we know the truth. The reason why this movie sucks so hard, the reason it is a painful chore to watch, is that it centers around photorealistic CGI lions. An aesthetic choice the creators committed to so hard that it tore the movie limb from limb. Characters who used to speak and have facial expressions now blandly open and close their mouths, their faces, the empty faces, of lions. Be prepared, this ridiculous, wonderful, fascism-evoking song is reduced to a lion just standing near some hyenas and talking. Yes, Leonine times are a-changing, which means that hyenas must too. Mufasa's death, which felt so huge, now looks like a, like a lion dying in a hole. And Simba doesn't look up and see his dead father in the sky, no, he sees some clouds. Simba. 
yes, these animals happen to be acting out the plot of The Lion King, but they are still animals. Animals who live in a world so real that it feels apathetic about their very existence. Apathetic about the audience's existence. And what a wonderful way to make a horrible movie, right? To use Disney's money, use one of its most beloved films to make this, this cold, clinical, empty mess. There's just something cosmically horrifying about that that I honestly have trouble articulating. Lion King 2019 almost feels like it shows us a world without art, a world where we are all dead and the AI are left generating purposeless content for no one and nothing. Point being, if you haven't seen The Lion King 2019, I would genuinely recommend it. Okay, let's move on to the 2016 Disney remake of Pete's Dragon. In this section of video, I say that Pete's Dragon came out in 1974. It came out in 1977. So when I learned of this movie as I was writing this video, I was actually pretty excited about it. For one, I'm not exactly a 1974 Pete's Dragon stan. I look in your eyes and you whisper sweetly. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I like the movie fine, but it's not some kind of masterpiece. You know, some of the songs are boring and kind of stock feeling. I thought the plot was kind of bloated. I legitimately think there are ways it could be improved. More importantly though, I was excited for the remake specifically because the original film is painfully, unapologetically goofy. It has a funny weirdo dragon who goes around making noises. <laughs> It has a crooked potion seller. Get out, you quack! I don't bring those pony remedies here again. It has a song called Brazzle Dazzle Day, and it rules. It's a brazzle dazzle day when you think of love and never of sorrow. Looking at this movie, I legitimately thought that Disney finally had no escape. They have to remake this movie, and that remake has to be dumb fun. But, uh, no. Disney just did what they always do with their remakes, what they did with Mulan and The Lion King and Dumbo. They made it serious, they made it plain, and they made it boring. They gutted the entire plot of the movie, so now it's not about a friendly dragon who aids a kid in need, it's about an orphan boy who grew up in the wilderness and now has to help a dragon find safety. Kinda like Free Willy. They changed the design of the dragon, so it's not cute and silly anymore, it's just a generic guy. Of course, they ripped out all the songs. And for what? What was the goal? How can they expect me to care about this new, dull movie? In some way, Pete's Dragon bothers me the most out of any Disney remake because it's not that bad. It tells a cleaner story than the other movies in this genre do. Sometimes it looks pretty, the performances are okay. And because it's competent, it just reminds me of how broken these movies truly are, how much they suck. Because no matter what happens, all Disney remakes can ever give us is some uninspiring, fake amazement. Wow, look how majestic that dragon is. Look at the real Lion King animals. Look at Dumbo flying. Are you listening to the majestic music we're playing? Aren't you in awe? Pete's Dragon 1974 is not a perfect movie far from it, but at least it embraces itself, enjoys what it's doing. It likes its own dumb plot, its odd-looking dragon. It's not afraid to be awkward or over the top or have people say silly things. Your voice is the sound of an angel singing. It's a movie. It has something it wants to do, and it does it. The original Pete's Dragon is, in its own way, vulnerable, and that's something that none of these Disney remakes can ever be. So, now it's time for us to end our special little video with a conclusion, uh, and here it is. I don't like movies anymore. Um, not just Disney remakes, not just Disney movies. I don't like any kind of movies anymore. I realized watching them now that I don't like them. What I do like, though, 
is selling you a streaming service. <laughs> Every month for the foreseeable future, I'll be releasing a little bonus video on Nebula. I have a bunch up now that I'll flash on the screen, and this month I'm trying to start a special little series of bonus videos about a very particular and special review of Toy Story 4. The whole thing, frankly, rocks ass. With a subscription to Curiosity Stream, where you can watch great nature documentaries like this sweet owl doc, you also get access to Nebula, where you get my videos early, those bonus ones, and access to tons of other stuff. Content from Sarah Z, Tom Scott, Lindsay Ellis. And this month, I wanted to highlight a very cool thing coming to the platform. My friend, Abigail Thorne, Philosophy Tube, made a play. I wasn't in England to see it live, but apparently it's gonna be on Nebula. I'm genuinely super excited to watch it. You know, what a badass thing to make. Anyhow, if you like the sound of that, the whole thing costs less than $15 for the whole year, so I'd say it's a really good deal, and it is a great way to help the channel. So sign up at the link in the description description if you want to. Anyhow, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much to my patrons, and like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed it. Now it's time for my Patreon question of the video. Beans asks, what does Forky's consciousness mean for the Toy Story universe? He knew he existed because she created slash loved him. How much does the magic extend to all other things? Why isn't the government using children to create billions of little loved toys to fight wars? So, I fundamentally disagree with the Toy Story philosophy on how it is that toys gain sentience within the Toy Story universe. I think it's retconned garbage nonsense. Not to say I don't like the movie, Toy Story 4 is really good, as you'll see in my uh, bonus video, which you also can get on Patreon. Uh, but the, the, the truth is, is that I don't buy that toys come into sentience through the love or awareness of human beings. In fact, I think that's stupid as shit. The reality, quite obviously, is that if you give a little guy a cute face and if you make a toy in some kind of factory, um, then that's a sentient toy in the Toy Story universe. That's how toy work. Now you ask a question about why we don't send them to war, what kind of war would they be interested in fighting? All they are interested in is the love of a child. Could the love of a child, in, you know, where, 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 where would the children be loving them? In Vietnam, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in, in Iraq? Where were the children be loving them? Anyway, um, thank you so much again. Um, enjoy the rest of your days, and I'll see you later. Bye. <coughs> I bet you're wondering which nasty little woman edited this video. <laughs> it was me.